Hey everybody, welcome to The Office Field Guide. My name's Chris and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever. Today, we are looking at Launch Party. It's supposed to say launch. Okay, wow, easy booster seat. Nobody cares about this party anyway. This episode was written by Jennifer Saletta and directed by Ken Whittingham. It first aired on October 11th, 2007. It was viewed by 8.9 million people and it currently has an 8.4 out of 10 on IMDb. Your trivia for Launch Party is, what is the total amount of reams sold by Dwight? As always, keep an eye out for hidden bloody nipple Andy somewhere in this video. First, put the correct answer to the trivia and or the timestamp of the Easter egg in the comments will get their name in next week's video. And some folks always feel a little slighted for not getting to the videos quick enough to win this contest. So I'm hereby declaring a new contest, an emoji contest. Rules are simple. Add a comment into this video with a sequence of emojis that best represents next week's episode. Next week, we're gonna be looking at money. I declare bankruptcy! The comment I think is the most clever or funny or efficient or a combination of all three will get a spotlight in next week's video. So with that, let's roll out the red carpet. I understand nothing. So I thought I'd start us off with a great callback that binge watching in the future makes us lose a little connectivity from. I have been salesman of the month for 13 out of the last 12 months. You heard me right. I did so well last February, the corporate gave me two plaques in lieu of a pay raise. So I had to do a little investigative work here, but Dwight's speech takes place in the very beginning of March. This is great continuity and it really makes lines like this. And that by six o'clock, the website will be the new best salesman in the company. Wow, watch out Dwight. Have some real weight to them. And speaking of speeches, Ryan's monologue at the beginning here is incredible. Seriously, this might be the best thing BJ Novak's ever done on screen. The humble brag depicted by the subtle smirk, the body language, and the quick talk. It's an amazing performance. I wish I could actually show you the whole thing, but YouTube will throw my video into a deep vault that will only be available in certain quaint regions of Europe. And speaking of Europe, I wonder what Michael thinks Europeans are really like. Why is it so tight? What's the European cut? This is the second time he uses it's European to justify his clothing choice. It's European, okay? It's a European cut. European offices are naked all the time. And I've seen it debated online about whether or not this is an article of women's clothing, but I don't know, having been in the situation of grabbing a shirt off the shelf because it said it was my size, then waiting to the very last moment to put it on just to see that it was way too tight and not in a flattering way, it's not fun. How many pounds do you think I could lose by seven? Depends how much have you eaten already today. Well, what's the deal with the awkward silence in this sequence though? Oh good, okay, cool. It just seems like this is nothing but filler. Much like the entire kidnapping section of this episode, similar to Michael running his car into the lake in Dunder Mifflin Infinity, Michael kidnapping this kid, it just doesn't make sense with everything we know about Michael. The only difference here is that the car had to do what Michael told it to do, and this kid didn't have to do it at all. So I don't understand why I went along with it. I'm not going in yeah, there. Yeah, you are, yeah, you are. And you will come out when you decide to give me a discount on the pizza, please, thank you. Stupid. Yeah. So why does he go along with it? Obviously, it's because the writers wanted him to. And we're starting to see a common theme throughout season four with the distrust of corporate practices and Michael calls it fair business practices. I'm not saying these writers are using their platform with one of the most popular shows in history to tell NBC to piss off, but I think they were. There's a weird connection with this pizza guy and Michael though. This actor, who is portrayed by Kevin McHale, would later star in Glee as this guy who Michael says this about in Viewing Party. And I know what Glee is. I am a total Glee. I oh, love me it. too. You know what my favorite character is? The invalid. And that's an interesting connection, but it's probably just a nod. It's not a continuity error, but this is. Do you remember what you said to me on my first day at work, just before you walked me over to my desk? Yeah. I told Michael that I had had a crush on you when you first started here. Oh. So if you ever felt a little foggy about the pre-camera history at Dunner Mifflin, it's because of little goofs like this. It doesn't really matter though, because this scene is amazing. And while we're on Jim, that's what she said. <laughs> he definitely signed someone named John Krasinski on Meredith's cast. Again, I don't even care. Krasinski plays a sequence so amazing. All right. 
But then Jim steps in it when a distraught Dwight stands up for, I guess, the now not shunned Andy. Not sure when that really happened, but Jim's for sure to blame for the foghorn. Stop it! Give me that! Give it! And in this week's episode, we were robbed of is more of a webisode. After last week's trivia about the rental car Michael drove into the lake, I was really intrigued and spent way more time researching the different vehicles drove by the various characters throughout the series. I think that's a video idea someday, but we were at least robbed of a webisode in which Kevin and Kelly walk us through the parking lot, pimp your ride style. I say that because I really want to see what's inside Dwight's trunk. Open the trunk. Inside you will see many pelts. Under the smallest one is a case. Inside that case is a bear horn. Bring it to me. But the only webisode we get in season four is in our imagination, because these became one of the most consistent points of contention between the writer's room and NBC. See, the writers weren't getting their residuals on any portion of this work, even though the webisodes were making ad revenue off of NBC.com, revenue from iTunes, and eventually bundled in the DVDs. The writers didn't see a dime of any of it, because those agreements were made between the production companies and the Writers Guild when the internet didn't even exist. So the studios got away with ripping off the writers, and thus a strike was looming on their horizon. One that disrupted season four massively. I was wrong in the last episode. There actually was supposed to be 30 episodes. I needed another hour. It could have been done in another hour. I think it looks good. But with that, let's get to, oh, I, I still need an edit. Um, is there anything that Dwight won't believe? I sort of control things with my mind. I don't believe you, continue. More instructions will follow. Cordially, future Dwight. You'll thank me later. If a vampire bat was in the US, it would make sense for it to come to a Sylvania. Like Pennsylvania. Who is the King of England? Why, the tyrant King George, of course. I don't care what Jim says. That is not the real Ben Franklin. I am 99% sure. And how big do you want this robot? Life size. Mm, no, better make it two thirds. Easier to stop if it turns on us. It appears that the website has become alive. This happens to computers and robots sometimes. Professor Copperfield's miracle legumes? Now that doesn't mean that Jim is gonna become a vampire. Only that he carries the vampiric germ. There are several ways to kill a zombie, but the most satisfying one is to stab it in the brain with a wooden stick. Okay, we will be Voldemort. He who must not be named. I wouldn't do that. Voldemort. Okay. Voldemort. Seriously. Voldemort. You really shouldn't be saying more. Wait. You resemble the Tolkien character. Ah, uh, he basically is, man. He's a regular banking wizard. No, 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 not a wizard. A hobbit. Do you live in a regular-sized house? Yeah, he is a normal guy. He's cool. I don't have a lot of experience with vampires, but I have hunted werewolves. I shot one once, but by the time I got to it, it had turned back into my neighbor's dog. Hmm. Oh, dude. Oh, how did... Oh. Jim is on a path now. An eternal journey. And I wish him well. But I have a destiny in this realm. That's impossible. It is, right? I mean, it's impossible. All right, I'll take him. Leave the telescope. Just filling in for Ryan as a favor. May you fight with the strength of ten full-grown men. <laughs> Michael, there's a Troy from corporate here to see you. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Oh, this is stupid. Yo, you don't even know what stupid is! Okay, so watching this episode and trying to think of the deeper meaning, a word kept popping into my head. And that was flamboyant. Flamboyant. Sometimes the old OCD part of my brain just needs to get off that track. But sometimes I have to pull that thread and realize that I might be onto something. Oxford has it as of denoting a style of French Gothic architecture marked by wavy flame-like tracery and ornate decorations. So like this. Does my room have cable? No. And the sheets are made of fire. Okay, the actual definition is an adjective denoting a person or their behavior that tends to attract attention because of their exuberance, confidence, and stylishness. And that actually fits the motif of this episode. Not flamboyance for flamboyance sake, but a clear undercutting of that flamboyance. This is going to be a long list, but you already clicked this video and I'm assuming you're in with me. 
Ryan is in his office, humble bragging about his awesome work, but is undercut by the fact that this corner office isn't even his. This is further saturated by this random guy. That was funny to see Ryan all embarrassed by that. Who recognizes Dwight and Michael and thanks them for knocking Ryan down a peg. Furthermore, Ryan says this. How about that image? Crystal clear. But the quality is crap. Of course it is. It's 2008 and they're teleconferencing on CRT TVs, but I think we're meant to compare this image with the clarity that's shown at the end. And is it weird that this is two episodes in a row that end with Ryan acting big? And just thinking about this, it's a website. I know it's 2008, but I mean, I was building websites for companies in 2008 with similar capabilities, so I can very much say it's not that big of a deal. Ryan throws himself a giant party, wasting a huge amount of company funds in the process. Not to mention he presumably has all of the branch managers read this. And that by six o'clock, the website will be the new best salesman in the company. Brag. But still looking at the flamboyant things, Dwight has a beard in this episode. I mean, not a beard, but some scruff. We see in this deleted scene that he has some bravado to go with it. What? Well, it's just that you had no hair on Friday. It's called being a man. You should try it sometime. But it's clear he's just hurting. I guess Dwight's horn counts as some flamboyancy here, as it's intended to draw attention towards himself and his victory over the first iteration of Computron. But while it's impressive that Dwight can outsell a company-wide website, his victory doesn't yield the booty he wants. Why are you looking at her like that? Hey! This one is subtle, but not only is it a callback to Fun Run. Got it. Carb up. Really? Power gel? Hey, if you want to win, you gotta fuel like a winner. But Dwight's overly intense psych up leads to this gentle phone presence. Yeah! Hello, Susan. Wait. Even Dwight's plaques are intended to show off his sales prowess, but inevitably leave us to wonder why anybody would accept that deal. And Michael, oh boy, does Michael attract some attention in this episode. Beep, 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 beep. We already talked about his evening attire, but his concern about having his trophy woman by his side leads him to say this. Well. Do I have your permission to invite Carol? Michael wants a Scranton party to be bigger and sexier and cooler than Ryan's in every way, but isn't willing to pay 60 bucks for 10 pizzas. I mean, I know they're like eating a hot circle of garbage, but come on, that's a steal. Speaking of stealing, this is a huge show of confidence in which Michael projects his feelings onto this glee kid because he's some hot shot and you don't know anything about sales. So stop being a disrespectful little jerk. Okay. Sales. So while he tries to portray the confident VIP type, He's shot down by Ryan, this kid, and this kid's manager. All right. What do you say? He said no. So we should let him go. No. Moving over to the side characters in this story, Angela's working her tail off for two weeks to pull this party together. But to what end? It will be compared to Denise Stem's party in Buffalo. Also, Michael's there to knock her down to size three times in this episode. Waste of time. What's that, Pipsqueak? Okay, wow, easy booster seat. Nobody cares about this party anyway. If you are not this tall, you may not ride the roller coaster. See you guys tomorrow. Andy's ice sculpture is a big win for him. Quickly undercut. I stole it. But I also love the date proposal to Angela. It's adorable, but it also is undercut by the delayed answer. Hey, how'd it go? Yeah, what'd you say? I don't know yet. And it's hard to see Angela come down so hard on Phyllis during this episode, but dang Phyllis, maybe you should spend more time focusing on your task than printing out web pages. I mean, getting forks and knives and stuff isn't that hard. But you know what's not flamboyant in this episode? Jim and Pam, and probably Creed and Kevin and Meredith. Anyway, the only non-flamboyant main characters with screen time are Jim and Pam. They're so low key. Even talking about the first time that they knew they liked each other, these are not huge events or gestures or whatever to attract someone to them. These are just subtle and real. One of the things I've always appreciated about the jam relationship. So what's the point? Well, I think the message here is pretty simple and it's to call people to be real. All the showboating, all the glitz, all the glamor, all the asportation of a person against the person's will. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, the distractions don't matter. I'm your boy. I'm hot. I'm so hot. <laughs> Ryan's and Scranton's parties are lame. The website and the salespeople are just selling paper. And what's real is what lasts. Or I don't know, maybe the whole episode exists for these two to pretend they're on an episode of Law & Order. In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate but equally important groups. The police who investigate the crimes and the district attorneys who 
prosecute the offenders. These are their stories. You ready to give me my discount now? No. Kung -kung! Listen up, kid. I don't like you, but because some town in Switzerland says so, you have rights. Kung -kung! Yeah! Hey, whoa, 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 what are you doing? I'm just scaring him. No, the trick is to make him think you're gonna do something to him. I can hear you, man. Shut up, or I'm gonna punch you in the throat. Hey, hey. Kung -kung! I kidnapped a kid. You had to, what other choice did you have? I gotta pay for the pizza. No. Yeah. Kung -kung! But with that, let's dish out some dundies. And then I gotta get him to the dundies. All right, the dundie for the best prank on Corel goes to the entire cast. Pizza by Alfredo. Yeah! Oh! I love that. It's a reminder that these people had a ton of fun at work. All right, and the secret client, Dundee, goes to Dwight Schrute. Okay, I really just wanted to call out that Dwight had a secret little red lockbox in his locked drawer. But let's rate this thing. This is the worst. All right, the cold opening. I love this cold opening. Having sat somewhere trying to pay attention to a speaker while the DVD logo bounces around, whether it was in school or at work, I'll admit it's captivating. I love captivating things. Anyway, I give this cold opening a four out of five. It hits a sweet spot of real and fun. And again, Steve Carell smiling. It could be an open air by itself. It's contagious. But this episode, man, this episode has some ups and some downs. I give it a three out of five. There is enough in here that made me laugh out loud, but not happy enough to see that I was reviewing it next. I do think it suffers from cramming too much into this one episode, which again is a season four problem. But that's just what I think about Launch Party. What are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments. Don't forget to give this video a like. It greatly helps me. Also subscribe if you haven't. Click the bell notification and you'll get notified next week when we cover money. I wanted you to know that you can't just say the word bankruptcy and expect anything to happen. I didn't say it. I declared it. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.